So, so Stephanie, it'd be awesome to get started with a little bit of your personal journey into the world of veganism. What's kind of brought you here? The biggest thing that brought me here was really more of a kind of health wake up call. It just was an opportunity, um, as I look back on it now, um, to really start to take better kind of care of my health, just pay attention to what I'm eating, what I'm taking in, and that the food that I eat matters and impacts my health. Now, my initial kind of wake up call happened to me when I was in college. You know, I'd been traveling, hanging out with friends. You know, I got back to school and, you know, my, my body just was not happy. I didn't know what was going on. I wasn't feeling well. And, you know, you think you're just, you know, under the weather, you know, not feeling so good. But then after a while, I wasn't able to keep food down. My body was really kind of violently responding to something that I ate. But I was like, okay, let me me go to the hospital and see what's going on. (laughs) Because this is lasting a little bit longer than I expected. And the odd part is the hospital didn't know what was going on. We went to the emergency room. Um, They just gave me more fluids because I was so dehydrated because I was losing kind of everything that I had eaten um, and I just couldn't keep anything down. So they sent me back home. I wasn't feeling well once again. Went back to the hospital because now this is a day later. (laughs) And they're like, we really don't know, but you're really still dehydrated. Let's give you some more fluids. So they give me more fluids. I go home. I think it's not not too big. It's not a big deal. I'll be okay because I've been to the hospital. But I happened to have an appointment that Monday. And, you know, when you're in college, like getting your free doctor's appointments are a big deal. (laughs) Like being able to secure them. Sometimes you have to wait much longer before you can get a new one. So I was like, I'm going to the doctor because this appointment, you know, it was... Um, it was an appointment I really wanted to make sure um, I had. So I go to the doctor, not feeling well, but I'm like, I'm showing up for this appointment because I don't want it to be rescheduled. And she's like, yeah, you shouldn't feel like this. This is crazy. So luckily, I had someone who went above and beyond. She started looking into the chart, started looking at the hospital because it was a college town. You know, she was able to call over, find out what was going on. Then they started taking samples. And it turned out that I had E. coli that what I had eaten was infected with E. coli. And then my body was so violently responding to it that not to, you know, the savior listeners, <laughs> but, you know, just everything in my body. I was literally on the floor at times and my body was just almost shaking and responding because of how this, um, you know, getting E. coli, how my body responded to it. So it was really, really tough days, but it was so much better once I knew what it was and, you know, why I was literally sleeping on the bathroom floor for days, um, because it just didn't make sense for me to leave the the bathroom at that time. So after you go through that and after you realize what it is, you start to go through the process, you know, the CDC Mm -hmm. calls you and they start asking you, where are you eating? (laughs) What have you been eating? (laughs) What's going on? Where is this coming from? And, And you start to understand kind of the food process. You start to understand how things travel and how diseases travel through food. And you start to understand that what you eat, how your body can respond to it and how you can get sick from these things. And even in our you know, unfortunate medical system here in the U.S. that you can go to a doctor and it just doesn't get detected. So what happened for me is it created an environment for me to be more proactive about my health. It created an environment for me to pay attention more and not be so reliant on other people to know what's going on um, in my body. And it also made me start thinking about the food that I ate and started thinking about some of the things that people not only were getting just from something like getting sick that, you know, was temporary, it it passed through, but the idea that, you know, food can be a cure, but food can also be something that causes a lot of these diseases that people um, are facing, like diabetes, a lot of diseases and a lot of challenges that people are facing. And the idea was that I wanted to pay attention to it and started to make change. So, you know, I was like a lot of vegetarians and vegans and people who first started out where I was like, oh, I'm a little bit of this. I'm going to take a little bit of this out. I'm going to figure it out. And I was probably not one of those people that had like the big wake up call where I like stopped everything right away. I don't know about you. Did you stop everything right away or did you gradually go through the process? I I did. I did. You know, it was, it was an overnight thing and it's 
I, at the time I thought, oh, this is quite common, but it, I found it's quite probably a little bit rarer. But for me, it was I watched Cowspiracy, and um, I was sort of a I was I was a day off from work on my own. My wife was at work. And you, you, the Netflix algorithm kind of detects something clearly that you're into, <laughs> or that you're about to be into, because it presented Cowspiracy to me, and I'd never heard of the thing ever. Didn't even know what it was. I actually, I, I, I naively thought, <laughs> this sounds silly now, but I naively thought because of the title, it might be like some sort of comedy or something. Oh, really? <laughs> so, Interesting. I don't, know why, I don't know why. I must like, I couldn't have been in the right headspace. I was just like, I was just like oh, I'll just put this on. It's, it's, I'll see what this is. Anyway, I, I was like rooted to the spot for the two hours or whatever. And I just sort of at the end of it was like, right, well, I need to do something about this. And uh, but my wife came home. I said, "You need to watch this," and and we watched it together. And then we were both of the same opinion. And then wow. the next day, it was like, "Right, how do we be vegan?" And it was like, I don't think we really had a clue what to do. Uh, <laughs> we gave a lot of we gave some tin stuff to like a local food bank. We gave the fresh stuff that we had to like some in laws on well, my in laws, Kate's parents. And um, and then we like went on a big shop, but even then we didn't know what to eat. So it was like, I don't know, we'd made up a plate with like carbs, like there was like rice, big load of hummus, falafels. It wasn't bad, but it was just like, you know, we didn't, didn't know what to do. It was like after about three weeks of eating that, it was like, right, we need, <laughs> need to figure out how to <laughs> eat something else. That. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. Anyway, I, 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 I didn't want to just take us away, but yeah, it was, it was a bit overnight for me. But m- most people, I find, it takes a little while just to sort of figure things out and so on. But um, absolutely. And for yeah. me, it was one of those things where, because I think I started on the health side, I was mm. almost evaluating and trying to figure it out. I was navigating in this, and this happened, you know, a while ago. I mean, I've been vegan almost sixteen years now, so. You know, wow. when I, there weren't the films at that time. No. Um, and honestly, I wasn't Different even world. aware of the animal rights issues. That's really yeah. what made me kind of stop dancing with the idea of vegetarian and veganism is when I really started hanging out with vegans. And I started to hang out with people who helped me understand, you know, what dairy means. And the idea that, you know, my dollars, my ability to create demand for something creates harm that creates, you know, death. And when I started to understand that and people started to show me the videos and, you know, because there's a lot more um, investigative reporting kind of was what was kind of on the scene at that time that when I started to understand that I'm making choices for these animals to be slaughtered and hurt Mm. and what really happens behind the scenes, that's when I really was like, okay, I'm going vegan. I'm, I'm done. And that's when like in 2005, that was kind of my, that was my, my year. That was the year where I made that decision. And, um, and there was no turning back for me at that point. I, I'm fascinated by that. Cause like you, like you say, uh, and as, as you, as you talked about it, I thought hey, you're absolutely right. Like from the point of view of, I think it is for a 2017, the, the 2017 class of veganism, looking at the sort of the, the 2005 class it it's a completely different world i'd be almost amazed if anybody i mean i imagine there was the odd person maybe who who maybe i don't know uh was speaking to a, somebody who was involved in street activism or something like that but i'd imagine for most people uh back in 2005 uh, and earlier like it would have been a slower progress uh because it like you say there's the documentaries there's social media there's the whole you know, you you don't tend to find out pieces of information like in over the course of time like you used to. You sort of like once you yes. like so like an afternoon and you've learned <laughs> like an encyclopedia's worth of information. So yeah, I'm I'm fascinated by like the the period of time back then because you know what was how how was veganism perceived? You know, when you started to talk about um this change this lifestyle change with your friends and your family and and the folks around you what was what was the general kind of response most people just didn't know what to do most people <laughs> kind of understood vegetarianism so they thought it mm. was just vegetarian vegan that's just the same thing right 
So I think a lot of people were just confused. Um, mm. Now, I had a unique scenario. My mother actually went vegan before I, I went vegan. Oh, but, wow. you know, I didn't live in, at that time, that's where I'm originally yeah. from, Philly, um, in the U.S. And I didn't live there. You know, I was in college. Now I'm going and, you know, I started my journey in college and I became vegan at that time. I was working a full-time job, you know, in Connecticut. So I had some exposure to it when I went home. I had some exposure to it, but my mother was the only person in the household who was vegan. And what was hard about it, I think back then, is people didn't know what to do. There weren't as many restaurants. Um, a lot of the vegan options were the only option. So therefore, you know, when I went to, especially corporate world, I would say the corporate world was the hardest part of the process because, you know, I'd be in environments where I had to eat at the table with everyone. You know, I was flying, um, you know, I was really in a very fortunate positions and roles at that time. So, you know, we'd have to catch a flight to the UK, you know, take a shower at the airport, <laughs> go to the meeting, you yeah. know, and then we'd stay there two days and then we'd come home, which was great experience, like amazing from a business standpoint. And even at my age at the time, but being vegan and doing that was very difficult. Because you would get on an airplane and an airplane would have the vegetarian dish, not the vegan dish. So therefore, the majority of the dish I couldn't eat. Um, yeah. You would get into scenarios where I'd land. Um, in an example of going over to the UK, it was a little, it was a little bit friendlier in the UK. But some countries I'd land in and you just wouldn't have food available. So it would be hard to kind of sustain without you like packing food, which is very difficult in the international scene. Yeah. And... I think what happened is it started to kind of separate you from the group. And I know some people still struggle with that today because depending on the circle you're in. But I bring it up because back then we didn't have Uber Eats like we have in the yeah. U.S. where people can like bring food to you. <laughs> you know, we didn't have these options where, you know, I could call a restaurant and be like, yo, I'm coming. What can you do? Can you put something to the side? Yeah. You know, we didn't have a lot of those things. And I want to kind of, I guess, impress upon people is that I still made it. I still did it mm -hmm. because the key was, is I try to help people understand why I made that choice, not convert people necessarily, right. but help them understand why I made that choice. And then I also spent a lot of time finding alternative solutions. So therefore I wasn't sitting in the corner or I wasn't, you know, not eating I would make sure that I did call those restaurants. I would make sure the person who was coordinating that they knew I was vegan and that there needed to be an option or at least someone attempting an option. Now, one time I went to an event and I had like pasta and like a whole like garlic piece, not just one little piece, you know, the whole thing <laughs> oh roasted. <laughs> and I'm like, how am I going to have a business meeting with like all garlic in my mouth? <laughs> just not going to work. <laughs> it's like everyone's going to smell me down the whole table. Incredible. So I love the thought process things. that somebody thought that was a, that was an option. It's just like, well, garlic's vegan, right? Let's just put all of it in. <laughs> so there were some missteps, but really helping people and then helping my team. And then also I used to bake. Um, I don't do as much as I do now, and I probably need to get back to it, but I would bring in like banana breads. I would bring in things to corporate meetings and to activities where, you know, everyone would bring in donuts or everyone would bring things in. Mm. And I would start to bring in a vegan option so people could taste it, so people could enjoy it. So some people were like, are you going to make sure you're going to bring in some of that banana bread next <laughs> week? <laughs> and, you know, creating that, what happens is that separation. Sometimes we feel when we go vegan and it feels like the rest of the mm. world hasn't gone vegan. I was able to bring that back together by finding common items that, you know, everyone ate, you know, doing that, you know, like potato salad. Everyone can eat and it can be vegan um, if it's made correctly um, and still tastes good. So being able to find those um, medium kind of stages was, was really key to my success in my journey. Thinking about that, so I've, I've had some of those experiences myself where you're, you know, you're staying at a, a hotel for in the, sort of the corporate world for, for work and so on. And, and I totally relate to those, the kind of afterthought options that you get, which is essentially like the side dish that everybody else was having, that you just get a bowl of it and there's nothing else um, and, I, and I totally get that feeling of like 
of of alienation if you like or separation from the the rest of the group um and and at sort of um it often led in my experience to some some folks kind of quizzing you know why was i doing this like compared to what they were eating and so on and so forth and you sort of that almost for me anyway but made it worse sometimes because i sort of ended up being like feeling like you know there's 12 people all sort of pointed towards you (laughs) quizzing you whilst you're trying to eat some dry couscous that you've been given Uh, (laughs) but you know you've you've been through that through those kind of experiences uh found ways to cope ways to deal i imagine spoken to lots of people in that course of the time who have gone vegan either slowly quickly all these kind of things in some of these settings what what kind of advice have you given or would give to people in those settings who feel that discomfort and and maybe feel a little bit of a a wobble at the beginning as to am i doing the right thing i think a lot of it is just kind of being you and being vegan and i say that to say that veganism doesn't have to separate you just like it doesn't separate me being a female, just like it doesn't have to separate me being African-American. It doesn't have to separate me, you know, being a Philly girl. I mean, there's all these things and dynamics of things that make up who I am. And I think sometimes as vegans, we think when we show up at the table, we have to only have our vegan flag flying. (laughs) So therefore it becomes like, Hey, I got it. You know it. (laughs) You want to talk about it? And I don't mean that there shouldn't be conversation about it. It's just that sometimes when you show up and you're at events, activities, and even at dinner, the idea is bring your whole self to the table. So when discussions come up, you don't have to have the sharp edge vegan discussion and the differences discussion. Sometimes what I like to do is I like to have the shared discussions. You know, when people are talking about their favorite dishes, instead Mm. of me talking about the meat that's on their plate, that's really would be upsetting to me. I may talk about some of my favorite dishes that are vegetable dishes and see if other people liked it. I would love to say, you know, my favorite vegetable is broccoli. I love broccoli because when I was a kid, I used to think it was like a tree. And if I bit (laughs) into the broccoli, it was like I was all powerful and big. And yeah, I was just (laughs) taking down a giant tree. And the idea is that when you share a story like that, someone else may be able to kind of like riff off of that story and say, you know what? I love peas because when I was a kid, this happened. And therefore, we start to create a shared food experience a shared discussion about food that isn't necessarily about you're not vegan and I am and you need to be vegan, but Mm. it becomes something where now we can share. And when we can share and bond a little bit, then we can have those later on discussions. Or I think sometimes people can observe you as like them. So it's not a large enough leap for them to now Mm. consider that lifestyle choice that you've made. Because if someone sees you as the opposite of them, it's a much harder discussion to say, now I want you to go vegan. But they're like, you know what? We grew up in cities. You know what? I love broccoli too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I played sports as a kid. We start to get all these common grounds. Then I can have a much deeper and maybe dicier conversation because we mm. built that foundation together. And to me, I think that's so important then, but even more important now. I love that. Well, that's, that's, that's top top advice. I definitely have been in the uh, uh, feeling like like you said the the need to fly the vegan flag, the need to be uh, the spokesperson for veganism, to answer all of the. Uh, well, I heard that uh, vegan food actually kills more animals than uh, <laughs> than me. You know, all all these kind of like you feel like you need to be armed sometimes, equipped with all of this. Uh, this this information you know you need to be the encyclopedia or the bible on um on veganism and like i just i love that point about like just find, find some shared shared ground and also that point around you know being vegan is a part of your identity but not your complete identity it's it's there's probably more common ground than there is things that separate us when we start to go beyond it so um and and actually it will probably help more people get get back to to veganism uh, as as something that they could relate to. I, I just I love all that viewpoint and um and 
and believe it or not probably haven't heard many people articulate it like that so a huge huge sort of thank you for thank you for that i'd love to just sort of you know moving into the world of um vegan business because you know when, when i think about your uh like you said your your experiences there working in some great roles within corporate environments um loads of omnivorous folks growing up in this sort of vegan non-vegan world that they, from 2005 onwards where uh there weren't the options there weren't the uber eats there wasn't the documentaries that all of these things that we now probably take for granted is like you know vegan culture quote unquote weren't necessarily there at what point did you sort of think do you know what i want to take a leap into kind of vegan business i think this is an important step uh to take it'd be, it'd be great to understand a little bit about that the thought process and then how you got there i think it was a little bit born from frustration which you know, I'm a fairly <laughs> optimistic person, so it sounds like weird for that to roll off my tongue. But I bring that up because, you know, when I was vegan, you know, I started in Connecticut and then I had a great opportunity to move to San Diego. So I was living in San Diego, you know, um, living still corporate life and everything. And at the time, I started going to all of these vegan restaurants. And I didn't have that in Connecticut. When I was in Connecticut, mm. I was always negotiating, you know, at restaurants. Um, I was very fortunate we had Trader Joe's and things like that. But it was really kind of difficult to eat out there. But when I was in San Diego, it was wonderful. It was such a just blessing to have all of these different options. However, what I noticed is not all of the vegan restaurants and stores lasted long. A lot of them would go out of business or they would struggle. And as you know, a person that loved eating out at the time, <laughs> I had some <laughs> unique relationships because I was there so often that I would ask people, you know, what's going on? What's happening? And most people I found were just struggling with the business side of things. They were struggling with the marketing, you know, struggling with the structure, organization, payroll, you know, accounting, all of that stuff is what was wearing them down. And they could make amazing dishes in the back. You know what I mean? They, the kitchen, yeah. they were a master. But when they had to start to do that marketing side of things or business planning or strategy, they just really were just worn down by it. It would bog them down. Or sometimes maybe they would not make some great decisions and then their business would have some challenges. And when I started to understand that that was a problem kind of in, in my community <laughs> um, where I was, <laughs> the businesses that I loved, I started to say, could I do something about it? Can I you know, be a part of that solution? Because that was my training in corporate America. That's what I loved to do. That's even a little bit of my, you know, my family was kind of a family of entrepreneurs. So I understand what it's like to have a family business um, and bootstrapping yeah. and all that good stuff. So it was just an opportunity for me to take a leap and say, all right, like, could I bring veganism together with my career and start a business and help other businesses? And I was dreaming, dreaming, dreaming way big. <laughs> um, and I was definitely <laughs> flying a little bit too high <laughs> at the time. So I had to make some corrections when I <laughs> started my business. But that was really kind of the, the starting point. The idea was, could I help people who wanted to run these businesses learn those skills and still do what they do well, whether it's make vegan sweaters, make vegan shoes, vegan purses. You know, the idea is, could I help them, you know, do the marketing? And what a, what a fantastic thing to, to want to do as well. I think, uh, I think you know, that you're absolutely right. Many people probably get into running their own business, combining it with veganism out of pure passion project, uh, an incredible sort of, you know, probably vision of where the end game should be or could be from like, you know, this ve normalizing veganism. But that doesn't necessarily marry up with their, their skill set. You know, like you say, they might be incredible at, you know, making T-shirt designs or, you know, cooking food or whatever it may be. But having the, the business chops to be able to back that up is something something quite difficult, different for for anybody. I'm interested in, like, you know, the, the experiences that you had um, supporting these kind of businesses. Was there any kind of common threads of, uh, 
I guess the same kind of missteps that you were finding, the same areas where your support was most required within those kind of vegan businesses, or was or was the gamut like broad, just like you know, like any business, everybody needed some different support in different areas for you. I would say the types of support were varied, but the I don't know, I think there was still an underlining theme that most people didn't have anyone in their business organization or anyone who's really dedicated to the marketing, who was dedicated to, mm. and I don't want to just say the marketing because sometimes we get into the tactical piece, but into the growth of the business. What happens is mm. for most of these businesses, you know, the owner was taking on so many roles and the role of marketing, growing, finding new customers, deciding, should I do advertising? You know, should I do an event? Um, and even at that time, you know, should I be doing social media? All of that was on their shoulders and they also had to, you know, do inventory orders as well. So when you're doing that and writing checks to pay taxes, it's hard to have that expertise in all of these different tools. So when we first started, that's where we filled the gaps. That's where we helped Mm. people is really kind of being an extension of their team and being able to say, okay, we'll help you do the social media marketing. Okay. We'll help you build a website. Okay. We'll put together an email marketing campaign for you, write it, schedule it and so forth. But, um, that worked for some businesses, but what we found over time (laughs) is most didn't have the budget for it. So that was the hard part. You know, when I started my business, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to have departments. And, you know, I almost took the corporate (laughs) model a little too, too far when I first started because I thought everyone was going to be ready. And when I was like vegan marketing, they were like, what in the world is that? And like when the vegans are like, what is that? (laughs) You worry (laughs) that the idea you have, (laughs) maybe it didn't land well yet. So I think, you know, starting a business back in 2009, we just, the world wasn't really ready to hire Mm. and do an agency model. Most people just needed a little bit of help here and there. And that's what we started to do is kind of be that resource, be that kind of filling in the gaps to help people and make sure that you have a website because, you know, if you have a restaurant, people want to see your menu before they show up. Um, They want to see the photos before they show up so that when they get there, you know, they're so excited. They're already, you know, can't wait to be able to take advantage of it. So that was one thing that we really tried to help people with. And even to this day, um, we don't do as much websites and social media management and so forth over time. And some of that's just because we've done it for years. Um, And as my business ebbs and flows, um, you know, we, we transition to other things. And also there's more experts out there now, which I'm so grateful yeah. for. But there's more vegan marketers. Like, I want more vegan marketers. I want more people in this space. I want more people doing what I'm doing because my goal is veganism, you know, worldwide. And to do that, businesses need support. So we need people who have all of these skills. So now I spend a lot more of my time kind of doing coaching, training, and really helping people who have a business now and have the budget to hire marketers or hire people that I can train their staff. I can teach them so they can bring that expertise mm. in house. I, I think, you know, thinking back to the, 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 the landscape in 2009, it, it feels like you were well ahead of the curve. You, you know, some, some might have even, I imagine people probably told you at the time you're too ahead of the curve <laughs> or, or perhaps, you know, are you, is, is this too early? And obviously you've been proven absolutely right. And so far as the, the sort of what feels like the sort of like exponential kind of growth in veganism, I know we've still got a long way to go, but I, I feel like, you know, in the last few years, or we talked about documentary, social media, things just seem to seem to be, um you know exploding uh in a in a in a really positive way within the vegan community i'm certainly seeing a lot more uh folks in the kind of like proud to wear the the badge of a vegan if you like as businesses whereas i think before some people would have been um scared to do that from a you know perhaps if we do that we're going to limit our audience and so on and so forth and then certainly the label doesn't seem to create quite i think it's probably still a bit of that but not quite as much as it might have done you know negativity from from folks generally I, i'm interested to hear your perspective on how you see since 2009 to 
2021 things have and I appreciate that's a big old question but how things have uh, how things have evolved in the kind of like the the vegan marketing uh, space do, do people do businesses have a have a have to have a very different tone have to, have, have you seen things largely stay sort of similar is there still resistance from the the kind of the the quote unquote mainstream outside of veganism and so yeah, I'm just intrigued to see what you think the the changes have been, how social media's impacted upon things, etc. I think the world has changed drastically, and like you said, the last probably even three years, four years, has really been a huge accelerator. So I think when I first started, things were a little bit more like steady, and then things have accelerated, and a lot of it I think has changed. Is you know. Veganism is becoming more prevalent in multiple generations and, and people are seeing the benefits of it for different reasons in different generations. And I bring that up because I think it's very important when we think about businesses and services, it's always about the market, the community that you serve. So when you have more and more people coming out of college that are going to be vegan, you're creating demand in the market. And when those people are coming out and creating demand in the market, they're going on the traditional websites and typing in the word vegan and getting frustrated because nothing's coming back. And it's not that the products that they have at some of these stores aren't vegan. It's just that they didn't tag them as vegan. They're not even putting them in a category. So a lot of that existed in the early ages, early days, because businesses were not just, were not even making it easy for you to even find them. Even if they only had four items, as an example, um, yeah. back then that was probably mostly the case because it was mostly like one, you know, vegan mayo, there was one vegan cheese, you know, it was, it was, it was <laughs> always the one. You never really even had to say the brand because those were just the options. But I really feel like those things have changed over time. And what we're starting to see is Consumers feel more comfortable with veganism. Now, yes, just like any label, there's always going to be groups that, you know, have a hard time with, you know, why this, why that, why don't we say it this way and so forth. But I really think veganism is a, is a title, is a, it's something that we should all be proud of. You know, um, I'm not as big of a fan with plant-based because plant-based mm -hmm. is not well-defined. Um, and therefore there's some gray areas where you all even have something that's plant-based that's not vegan and people yeah. don't know. And to me, that was really concerning where what I love about veganism, it's really well-defined. So if you see the word vegan on a product, when you turn it around, you can have a level of confidence, um, in it. So that to me is something that is big, something's really important. Um, and I also think that. I guess consumers have shifted because now with individuals going vegan, maybe because they're coming out of school, they've had the education, they've watched the, um, you know, they're watching Netflix, they're streaming and so forth. But then you also have generations um, where people are going vegan for health. So mm -hmm. therefore you have people who may be older who are trying to say, you know what, I want to turn around my health. I really, you know, I just retired and I want to live this retirement well. And therefore what they're doing is they're starting to make changes and switch over to veganism. So therefore it's not just like, I know vegans that like live across the street or five blocks away. What's happening now is there's a vegan in your family. So your niece is vegan, your nephew is mm -hmm. vegan, your cousin, your aunt. And when that familiarity has spread, that to me has made such a difference in the movement because you love your niece, you love your aunt, <laughs> you know, or <laughs> their sibling or whoever it is. And therefore, you want to be open to a decision that they've made. You want to be open to it. So therefore, I think it makes it easier for people to have more family events and have some vegan options on the table for holidays. You know, it makes it easier for people to consider it. And it's almost like it's being brought into their home as opposed to being forced into their home. And to me, that dynamic and that change has allowed businesses to be the option for people who maybe aren't vegan to choose and buy vegan products because that's really what's propelling the market forward. It's not really the vegans because our populations are yeah. fairly small, but it's really the non-vegans. And it's the non-vegans that are eating vegan sometimes. They're eating vegan or buying vegan because they're buying it for family members. Um, it's individuals that are exploring it. 
um, and starting to understand not only is veganism an answer for saving the animals, but veganism is an answer for, in many cases, reversing climate change or climate issues. Um, veganism is a way for us to really be more sustainable in the products that we use. You know, you're starting to see more like combustible spoons and, <laughs> you know, things that all of that I feel like kind of gets wrapped together. And I think those changes has really changed the market because it's not just about the food on our plates um, as much anymore. People are starting to understand that veganism can really change the world in so many ways. So whether it's personal to your health, whether it's saving the animals, which is so, so important, and also being able to make this a better earth for future generations, it really becomes such a yes, 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 I should do it. Um, because it really has so many solutions for the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'd love to get your perspective on something there. So you just triggered a thought in me around um, bigger businesses. Obviously, we're seeing lots of bigger businesses turn to the vegan option. We're seeing the Burger Kings, the Nestle's, the, these different companies coming out with vegan Kit Kats and vegan burgers and this that and the other and in this sort of and, and I, i'm always conscious of like maybe I, I live in too much of a a vegan media bubble sort of thing you know speaking to other other vegans exclusively on social media is etc but um i see a lot of um the vision and viewpoint around this this subject i see people sort of saying well this is this is vegan washing you know but by by these companies they're not necessarily, you know, there's not any kind of altruistic uh, intention there. They're not really trying to change things. Um, and then on the flip side, you see, well, no, this is progress. You see a lot of the kind of the the, the sort of vegan news sites, the plant-based newses and the live kindlies and the, you know, these, these folks reporting this as like, as a sign of progress. You know, the headline is there's a new Kit Kat from Nestle and it's vegan. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to get your perspective on that because I from almost from a day to day basis, I swing both ways on this particular. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like, yeah, this is progress. This is good. This means that my, you know, my great auntie June is going to buy a potentially she's going to get a Kit Kat. She might have a conversation. And then on the flip side, I think, well, no, it's, you know, Nestle are just taking an extra the, the one percent that was left on the table. They're taking that as well. So I'd love to get your perspective. Um, I think, I guess two perspectives I have. I think number one and foremost is that we always have to understand our power as consumers. So I think before we, you know, decide the good and bad, I think the question is we get to choose which brands we support. In many cases, we have choices. Now, not everyone has choices. Not everyone has what they need in their backyard. So mm. I completely understand but people who do have that choice, who can decide which store you're going to go to, what website you're buying your products from, what you're going to get shipped to your house, I really tell people to pick the brands and the businesses that you believe in. So mm. if there's a business that you feel like they're just, eh, I'm just going to put this product out there, you don't have to support them. You don't have to put your dollar there. You can support small businesses. You can support local businesses. You can support brands that you really feel like put back into your community. Now, it doesn't mean everybody big is bad. I think sometimes we have to be very careful that like if they're big, if they're this, if they're that, you know, there's this curtain and behind that, who knows what's happening. <laughs> um, so I think we have to be careful that, you know, we're not like scared of monsters under the bed kind of um, theory. And what we have to understand is that sometimes these bigger brands have the resources and that's why you see brands that are being purchased by larger businesses, by businesses that are not vegan in nature. But what happens mm. is the, these, some of our vegan businesses get so big that the only way for them to continue to grow is to be able to work at a totally different scale. And that's mm. why they have to go into some of these businesses. And I personally feel like that's a good thing. 
That's a good thing that growth is at that point. And I also think it's a good thing because a lot of my foundation in why I'm vegan is for the animals. And while I want small businesses, I mean, that's like my passion every day. I also don't want animals slaughtered and murdered and just the the conditions that they're in. I want that to stop. And most of the big companies, they're the ones doing it. They're doing it at scale. They're creating the problems that we have. And if we can get them on track to stop that behavior, to reverse that, to see veganism and vegan products as a profitable market for them to move towards, because many of them, they are going to be looking at the bottom line. I think that's a good thing because if we can save animals, if we can take them out of this, um, out of our food supply, if we can make those big changes, then we can even move further for the ethical side of things. We can move people's minds forward when our choices and the things that we are doing and these businesses are doing are really much more in line with what many of us want. But I agree with you. It is tough. It is tough to decide. Do I only go to a vegan restaurant or do I go to this restaurant that has two vegan dishes on the menu? And I really feel like you have to hit both because I need that non-vegan restaurant to know that they put those two vegan items on there and they should never take it off again. That it becomes the most popular dishes on their menu. Because if that happens and they start to see that, they will explore more and more veganism. More and more people will go there. Their staff will get educated. Their chefs will get educated. And what happens is there's this this effect that happens where when people get exposure to it, it can create greater acceptance. I love that point. I think you've summed up the, the nuance uh in the in the argument uh very eloquently <laughs> uh, certainly far better than i did in my attempting to answer ask the question so i really appreciate it and i'd love to um just whilst i'm i'm sort of help, uh, allowing you to sort out my personal quandaries i'd love i'd love to um to pose another one in the, in a similar sort of vein uh for you if that's okay and that's one about um the rise in in sort of vegan convenience, vegan processed and vegan kind of junk food, if you like. So we, we've obviously seen loads of these options. We all probably personally love them to, to, to some extent. And I certainly have unfortunately got a sweet tooth. Um, and so the the uh, the likes of the, you know, whether it be the the, the sort of uh, fish food equivalent in uh, Ben and Jerry's as the, the vegan version or whatever it may be, that mm-hmm. those kind of junk food products, I think, are, are appealing. I, I, so on one side, I see this as great. This is the option that, again, you can walk into the local supermarket, or whatever, and you can find this uh, this pizza or this whatever it may be and think, amazing, I, can, I don't have to restrict myself. On the flip side, I think one of the key benefits of veganism is is improving our health um maybe that's a key to keeping people vegan if you like um Mm -hmm. is that they feel the the health benefits and so i sort of have a have a slight concern that we almost create a another problem for ourselves by you know are we we're not solving a health problem we might actually be creating another one because you see some companies using the word vegan almost as a as a byword for healthy they kind of know that it sort of triggers in people's mind that vegan equals healthy and so yeah i can eat as much of this ice cream as i like um so i sort of have a have a slight concern i i'd I'd love to get your view on whether you think that's probably a misplaced one (laughs) no i don't think it's misplaced i definitely think there's some concern there because if we just trade one junk food for another junk food Um, You know, we still will have groups of people who are impacted. We have groups of people who don't have access to fresh vegetables. Um, Mm. And while, yes, I want them to have a vegan option, I also want them to have some fresh vegetables. Um, You know, so that's something we we need to solve. So I definitely think there there's some concern there. But I also think we have to we have to remember the journey. We have to remember Mm. this process. And for many of us, we weren't born vegan. For many of us, the foods we eat are not just an extension of, you know, what's in the kitchen, but some of the things we eat are extension of our culture. 
They're extension mm-hmm. of our upbringing. And some of the stuff we eat is so tied to an emotional experience or a time when this happened or when I, you know, that moment when I got ice cream with my, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with my dad or my cousin and remember this happened. And what happens is we really have an emotional relationship with our food. And to come in and tell people to rewrite that story, to change that story completely and say, no more ice cream for you forever (laughs) is a lot. You know what I mean? It's a big jump that we're asking people to take. And I really feel like our society has to move forward and make steps forward. And some people are going to leap further and other people are going to crawl there. And I don't think there's anything wrong with a person who's taking it one step at a time. I don't think there's anything wrong with a person getting there because we have to think about the long game. Um, Mm -hmm. So I really think sometimes we have to allow people to get there, to stumble their way (laughs) to success. Um, And that may be their journey. Um, And also, I think there's multiple roles in our society. You know, there's always that aspirational role. And we need people who are on that aspirational side. But we also need people who are on this practical side that are like, you know what? I want you to eat better. And you're eating at all the fast food restaurants. It's the only place you eat. I need you to eat plant-based there. Because the change mm-hmm. or the shift of getting them to not eat at fast food is much bigger than veganism. You know, it's probably ingrained in them for a totally different reason. They don't think they have time. You know what I mean? There's a ton of things that are making them make that decision. So Mm -hmm. therefore, I want to meet them where they are so they can start on that journey, start to see they have choices. They can make a change. And then from there, maybe I'll get them to eat at a better restaurant because they're probably not going to come home and cook because they probably haven't done that in 15 years or whatever, because that's not their thing. (laughs) So I don't want to take someone, I don't want someone to feel like I have to hit this next perfect milestone or this next ideal milestone. I really think we have to give people different lanes. And also people have choices in the world. You know, it's kind of like if someone came in here and told me I could never have sugar again. Yeah, I know I shouldn't be eating as much sugar as I do. Yeah, I like cake. I love me some vegan pound cake, <laughs> but, and I know when we make it and it's horrible because I make it at home. We have the whole cake. You know, when I go out, you get like two slices <laughs> but at home. We just slice and slice and slice and slice. Yep. And then my husband and I look at each other like, did we eat that whole thing in two days? <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's, there's things that we all can do better, but I really feel like we need multiple lanes for people to get there, especially if we're trying to get to this vegan world. And also, I think a lot of what veganism has also brought to the forefront is getting people to pay attention to what's in their food, you know, Mm -hmm. getting away from a lot of these proprietary ingredients and labels, helping people understand that, you know, what is the source of these items? Because, you know, I didn't know whey was uh, milk product. It just had its own name, casein. There are all these terms Mm. that are put out there in the world. And until I got educated, until I became vegan, I didn't understand what those things were. You know, most of things that we were purchasing were, you know, either cost or taste. You know, those were your decisions. Where now we as consumers can make better decisions and now start buying brands based on how clean the product is. And by brands that actually have fully disclosed labels, you know, brands that even work with some of our favorite vegan brands, because it is exciting to see some of our bigger vegan brands work with some of these fast food companies to bring it in, um, in front of people. So I really, I'm excited about that opportunity, Mm. but I don't know where it's going to go. You're absolutely right that it could go sideways. We could have a scenario where we eat vegan, but we're still not at that health mark. So I think there is some things we have to pay attention to. Um, but I think that's with everything. And it goes back to maybe what yeah. we talked about earlier, mm-hmm. that we have to be careful that the lane or my life is not just vegan. Like my life is, I want a vegan world, but I still got to pay attention to my health. I still have to pay attention to what is going on and the choices that I'm making. And it's not even just about the food I eat because there's things that are impacting my health that has to do with stress. 
mm-hmm. you know, and I can eat as great, as wonderful as I want. But if I'm going to stress myself out all day, I can have an unhealthy life and I could take on all types of conditions because I'm not solving and paying attention. So to me, I think veganism helps me pay attention more, helps me feel empowered more. It helps me see possibilities in front of me instead of succumbing completely to, and now don't get me wrong, I, I'm up, like I said, I'm optimistic, so <laughs> I, I'm always trying to be a better Stephanie, but the idea is veganism helps me see that possibility um, in the world, and it helps me translate that not just in my food, but in how I interact with people, how I treat people, you know, how I try to be more patient with people, which, you know, patience is one of those things I continue to work on. Um, And to me, that's been the other benefits of being vegan is being a person that starts to pull that ethical lens through all the types of things I do, all the types of discussions, even the way I argue with my husband, I'm trying to make sure I do better (laughs) because, (laughs) you know what I mean? It does, it's not helpful for me to always, you know, be ready for confrontation in things. If I'm saying I'm a vegan and I'm a compassionate person, I care about the animals. But if somebody, you know, cuts me off in traffic and I got to chase them for two blocks, there's a problem. <laughs> you know, there's something, <laughs> something wrong here. And I think those are things I, I always tell people to pay attention to because um, you're not pulling it through your full life. Hundred percent. I love. I feel like I've had a, 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 a an education here. I've, I've, I've really enjoyed this chat, Stephanie. It's been it's been wonderful. Lots. Of, I'm going to go away in a very reflective mood. I think and really really have a good have a good look at myself. I'm, I'm probably not going to give up all the vegan ice cream just yet. But you know, um, the rest of it, I'll definitely be paying attention. <laughs> but that's the thing. I think it's one step at a time. You know, like I've been trying to work out more. And when I first Mm. started, I just walked for 20 minutes. Like, I know I need to lift weights, but at first I think, I thought I didn't even have time. Like, I was just too busy at work Mm. to walk. And that was my, I believed it. Like, that was it. Mm. (laughs) So I just could not do it. And I mean, I could not, I could not walk out of my house and leave my desk (laughs) for 20 minutes. Like, my mind said, no, it just didn't work. And I had to rewrite that. So I think sometimes it's just taking those steps. But like I said, I'm not trying to make it sound like I'm the poster woman (laughs) for (laughs) health. (laughs) You know, I have a freezer full of goodies um, that are my go-to. And I think the key is just getting one step better at what you're currently doing and also helping other people in the process. Love it. Absolutely love it. Time is getting away and I absolutely want to talk about um, your podcasting. So okay. I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about it, like how, how you got into it, how it's going. Uh, yeah, love to hear the story. Oh, sure. I think I more like stumbled into it because I started when, you know, kind of the, the stay at home order started. Um, when the um, pandemic kind of hit um, most of us around the globe. So I started mine around April. So in March, when I was kind of chilling and trying to figure out what I'm going to do, my business had changed and my clients were struggling and people just weren't sure what they were going to do moving forward. Um, I wanted to find a way to bring content to people on a consistent basis. I wanted to inspire people. And some of it was I wanted to do it and be on camera and be in a podcast But I also wanted to talk to people to just see how they were doing. Because honestly, in this first couple of months, when everything hit, most of my clients just wanted to talk. Um, Mm. They just really, people just felt so uncertain of what to do and how to move forward. So it's just a conversation kind of thing. So I started saying, okay, well, maybe I'll, I'll interview people. And then I was like, wait a minute, if I interview people, I could turn that into a podcast. (laughs) <laughs> and what I kind of learned over time was that, you know, it's so great to be able to create content that people can access on the go, that people can access anywhere. Because some people, like we even talked about before we started, some people love the video content. 
But yeah. some people walk and listen to it. Some people work out or in the car or, you know, when they're traveling, that's how they're getting their content. And what I love about podcast is it's such a, it's such a cool way to kind of come into someone's ear, <laughs> but, yeah. and just be talking to them. And it almost feels like, you know, they're, they're just, they're in the room, you know, like they're literally in the room probably with yeah. us right now. Like that's how it feels if you're into podcasting. And I was really excited about the idea of trying to be able to get into that world, but I had to learn. I mean, I had to learn what to do with my mic, my camera. Um, I think there's so much to, there's so many things that keep people, I think, from doing podcasting because it can, it has a lot of technical aspects to it. But I think what helped me overcome it is I'm kind of a person that's like, I'll do it one step at a time, just like I was talking about yeah. with everything else. So if you look at my earlier videos, they were my webcam on my iMac, which is like seven years old. No, it's eight <laughs> years old now. So you know what that webcam looked like. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> and, <one. laughs> yep. So, you know, it was nice and fuzzy, but it was okay. I was there. Um, so what I've learned, and same thing with lighting. I didn't have lighting in the beginning. You know, I had to figure it out. I was a little bit dark. I was a little bit gloomy. I was maybe a little too cinematic um, in the beginning when I was doing it because I was learning. And I think, and I don't know, I'm curious what you, you think or your journey's been like, but I think being comfortable kind of learning while other people are watching is such a totally yeah. different skill. Because it's hard because you want to be perfect on screen. You want to be perfect on mic. You want to be perfect when they hear it. But being comfortable with the idea that it's going to take a time for you to find your rhythm. And I think that's been probably my biggest learning or lesson learned in, in the podcasting world and kind of going into this is that it's okay if it doesn't have to be perfect. Some people will enjoy me on this journey and enjoy me getting better and better at interviewing, getting better and better at speaking it better and better at, you know, projecting, <laughs> you know, all of those things. And it, it's even fun sometimes for me to look back and look at some of those videos and, and see when I wasn't looking in the camera like I was <laughs> supposed to be. <laughs> I a hundred percent, um, uh, relate. Like I, I, I saw, um, like a meme the other day that absolutely summed this up for me. This feeling is, uh, and it was encouraging people to just get out there and do something and don't worry about the, the perfection of it. And it was kind of showing a, a picture of the first episode of The Simpsons. Like <laughs> it showed The Simpsons sat on the sofa, like 1989. I don't know if you re if you remember the, what that looked like, that image. And then it showed like the 2021 kind of Simpsons sat on the, the sofa. And uh, it was kind of like the, the message being not everything has to be perfect when you start out, you know, and um, I, I feel exactly the same. I, st I started it with a degree of technical knowledge, but not really, not really that much. I just thought I'll get some kit and I'll get it off eBay and it'll be great. And then I'll kind of slowly um, learn bits and pieces and you learn how to edit a bit better and things. And, and even just like how to how to like I'd spoken to lots of people in an interview format for work and stuff but it's a completely different um scenario and so I, I, I like you I kind of listened back and now I've you know obviously started the video ones are more recent but started uh, you know if I listen back to episode one I'm kind of like wow like how how did I let this go out because if I did that if I did that this week I'd be like you can't put that out there it's, it sounds awful like the questions are terrible like, you could probably say well they're not that much better now but but trust me compared to episode one i was um you know it's a definite uh i'd say a definite improvement so yeah i i completely agree with you and i actually i i, I think i've probably played that forward into other areas of my life and thought do you know what just do stuff just do yeah. things see how it goes see how people receive it if it works, it works. If it doesn't, you've learned something. You know, like what what's the worst that can happen? So, I'm I'm absolutely with you. Where can folks go about seeing and hearing your your wonderful podcast? Uh, all, all the all the podcasts provide uh, the classic line we all say wherever you get your podcasts. But <laughs> for folks who um for folks who uh, who don't, who don't know where where would they where would they search? What would they look for? Etc. Yep. I mean. 
We are on pretty much all the major distributions. So whether you're Spotify, Apple, Google, you know, all of the, the major channels as well. Um, as well as we use, um, we probably are distributed on at least maybe 15 different podcasting software. So just like you said, really wherever you're looking for <laughs> or listening to your podcast, just do a search um, and see if we're there because most likely we are. But what I also tell people is to come to our website because that's probably the easiest way yeah. to to find us and the easiest way to get started. And then from there, we do list majority of the links on our site so you can link out to them as well. So if you go to our site, veganmainstream.com, um, we have a couple of different options at the top where we have some our, our freer tools. Um, and if you click on that in the drop down, you'll see our two podcasts there. One is designed um, to talk about interviews. So it's called Pivot. It's about really vegan businesses and entrepreneurs and people who have been pivoting, changing, trying to find their way forward. And then our other podcast is called Spark. Um, and it's just me on the screen, which is an interesting experience and me, obviously, in your ear. And I just kind of tackle, you know, kind of the some of it emotional things. Um, it's the way we look at our businesses um, and also Sometimes I just want to inspire people to think differently that week, um, to just kind of imagine things differently. So I do some crazy topics like pain versus discomfort in your business and the idea that, you know, you're going to have a little discomfort, but pain is when you're going too far and you got to ease back. So I try to um, spend a good amount of time just really hopefully inspiring people because running a business is hard. Sometimes it's emotionally draining. Sometimes it feels super lonely because you're making all the decisions. And I try to be kind of that voice in a person's ear from a podcast standpoint that is inspiring them, encouraging them, and letting them know that don't give up because we need you. We need you to make this vegan world possible. And I'm hoping the podcast can be an opportunity for people to ultimately continue doing the great work they're doing. Wonderful. I thoroughly recommend everyone check it out. I'm, from my experience over the last hour, I feel like uh, ha having uh, having your sage advice into my ears has absolutely been uh, been been one to get me thinking and get me uh, moving forward with positivity. So just a, a huge thank you for your time, Stephanie. I really appreciate. It. I know you're super super busy uh, with everything going on. So thank you, thank you so much for your time, and hopefully speak again soon. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. Honestly, I had a blast. This is really fun. Just kind of chit chatting and talking. Um, I try to resist the urge of asking you questions because I almost feel like we're sitting down at a table talking. <laughs> so this is just wonderful. I really am really excited and happy that I had this opportunity to talk with you. I also had a chance to look at your podcast too, which is really phenomenal. And I'm really excited about that. And I'm really um, looking forward to telling my world um, about your podcast if they don't already know about it. So um, I'm really grateful for the work that you're doing and thanks for having me. Oh, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you.